Soyuz MS-22 was leaking coolant on the ISS, Orion has returned to land, China's beaten the USA to a new launch record and much more is coming up in Saturday's Tomorrow Space News. It's time for another roar of a raptor. As on Thursday, SpaceX ignited one Raptor 2 engine underneath Starship 24 for about 7 seconds. This epic drone shot was tweeted onto the SpaceX Twitter account and it's giving me proper Apollo 13 vibes. That would be the movie, not the mission. Before the static fire however, Ship 24 was seen flapping its flaps, ensuring that they still work as intended. These aero services are essential for the belly flop manoeuvre, which hasn't been performed for over a year. A new test tank with the serial number S26.1 has been transported over to the site which was formerly Massey's gun range. It'll be interesting to see what SpaceX do with this tank next. Maybe some cryoproofs? Booster 7 was transported back to the production site about a fortnight ago, opening up the orbital launch pad. Just after S24 had finished up its static fire testing, an engineless Booster 9 departed High Bay 2 for the launch site. It has some interesting upgrades such as this Starlink dish installed on the tip of one of the chines. And even though the OLM is now open, B9 was left at the cryo station. This means that the booster can be hooked up to the cryogenic lines, allowing cryoproof testing but it doesn't have to be lifted up onto the pad by the chopsticks. Exactly 50 years after the beginning of the end of the Apollo program, the end of the beginning of the Artemis program was upon us with Orion splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. Following a couple hours of initial observations by teams in inflatable boats, Orion was pulled into the well deck of the USS Portland recovery ship. The capsule was then secured onto the cradle, allowing the well deck to be drained and the ship to sail to San Diego. Arriving at the US Naval Base San Diego on Tuesday, Orion was offloaded on Wednesday. No issues were detected from observations on the boat, but the deep investigation is yet to begin. In California, the Biology Experiment 1 payload was extracted, allowing scientists to access the samples before they begin to degrade. Orion was then closed up for transport to the Kennedy Space Center on the back of a truck. When Orion arrives at Kennedy, it will be taken to the multi-payload processing facility where other payloads will be removed and most importantly, the heat shield will be removed and analysed. This is the first time since the return of Apollo 17 that a crew-capable spacecraft has returned from the moon and a much stronger heat shield is required than returning from LEO such as SpaceX's Dragon and Boeing Starliner. The data gathered during the re-entry phase of flight is arguably the most important of the flight as it cannot be simulated without a trajectory from the moon. Wow, what do we have here? Has the wintry weather reached the ISS? Will the astronauts aboard get their own white Christmas? Sadly not, as what you're looking at is coolant leaking out of the Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft which is currently docked to the Nadir port on the RASVET module. The leak started around quarter to one in the morning UTC on Thursday with NASA TV going ahead with their coverage of an EVA by cosmonauts Sergei Prokopyev and Dmitry Patelin at 2am. This spacewalk was ultimately cancelled by Russian managers in Moscow because of this leak. The plan for what is officially known as Russian EVA 56 is to install a radiator onto the forward facing side on the Nyoka module which has been waiting on the side of the Rasvet module since it was delivered by the space shuttle Atlantis 12 years ago. The primary issue which now must be dealt with is the safety of the cosmonauts and astronauts who flew up to the station aboard MS-22, that being the aforementioned Prokopyev and Patelin as well as American Frank Rubio. If there is an emergency aboard the ISS and the crew has to evacuate, Soyuz MS-22 is their ride home. With this hours long coolant leak, the flyability of MS-22 is unknown. With the coolant fully leaked out of Soyuz MS-22 and the next Soyuz spacecraft, MS-23, not scheduled for flight until next March, what would you do in this situation? Let us know down in the comments. And just before we get into the world's first methane orbital launch attempt from China, make sure to go and watch our exclusive interview with Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, which was broadcast live at 8pm Eastern on Friday. In his first interview since the Dear Moon crew announcement, we asked the burning questions that the community wanted the answers to. Is he taking his orange suit to space? Find out at the link in the corner. Now, let's check out some launches. 
Going back to Monday, China kicked off the week with Cheyenne 20A and 20B, which were launched at 0822 Universal Time from Site 9401 at the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center on this Long March 4C. The satellites are classified, so our knowledge of the mission ends there. On the 13th, the rumble in the jungle returned as Intel sat to a launch in Galaxy 35 and 36, and UMET sat to a launch in MTGI-1 on this Ariane 5 from ELA-3 at the Guyana Space Center in French Guyana at 2030 UTC. All 10 metric tons of payload was delivered to a geostationary transfer orbit, providing the planet with more data on weather and more bandwidth for telecommunications. It's now time for the big one we've all been waiting for, at least metaphorically. Landspace launched their Zuka 2 rocket from Launch Complex 96 at the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center at 0830 and 25 seconds universal on Wednesday. And in the process, the Zuka 2 became the first orbital class methane powered rocket to reach for the skies. Sadly, however, Landspace were unable to claim the first methane powered rocket to orbit awards as the Vernier control engine on the rocket's second stage shuts down prematurely at the the same time as the main engine, which was not supposed to happen. This lack of thrust resulted in a maximum velocity of 5 km per second, falling quite short of the 7.8 kms required for a stable orbit. What rocket do you think will claim the methane orbit record now? Will it be SpaceX's Starship? What about Relativity's Terran 1? And don't forget about ULA's Vulcan. Or could Land Space's second flight of the Zuka 2, what you're looking at right now, be launched before all of the aforementioned vehicles? Only time will tell. China was knocking it out of the park a bit this week, so they also launched a couple more rockets, their third of the week being an addition to the Yaogang 36 Group 4 constellation. Three military reconnaissance satellites were launched at 1825 Universal, also on Wednesday, from LC-3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. This flight on the Long March 2D marks the type's 40th successful consecutive mission. China's last launch of the week came in the form of Cheyenne 21, which launched on this Long March 11, also from Xichang at 0617 UTC on Friday. A common theme this week is the payload was also classified. It's time for SpaceX to catch up, and the next launches of the week were all from them. First up, the Surface Water and Ocean Topography, or SWAT, mission from NASA, Kinez, CSA, and the UK Space Agency. It was launched on Falcon 9 B1071 from Space Launch Complex 4 East at the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California at 11.46 and 47 seconds universal on Saturday. SWAT was successfully delivered to its initial 857km polar orbit, whilst the booster returned to landing zone 4 on the Californian coast, concluding its sixth mission. Also on Saturday, but later in the day, at 2248 UTC, we have the launch of O3B Empower 1 and O3B Empower 2 on another Falcon 9, but on the other coast, from Slick 40. These two satellites were launched on behalf of SES to an 8,000km medium Earth orbit at a 70 degree inclination. The booster supporting this mission, number B1067, concluded its eighth flight by touching down on a shortfall of Gravitas. There was a telemetry loss whilst it was re-entering the atmosphere, so we didn't actually know if the booster landed successfully or not for a longer than normal period. As the saying goes, it's better late than never. And to round out the week, we have a launch two doors down at LC-39A. This flight is Starlink Group 4 Mission 37, which saw the introduction of a new flight record. After sending the second stage off on its way to an initial 335 by 232 km orbit with 54 Starlink satellites on board, Falcon 9 B1058 returned to Earth and landed on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions, becoming the first orbital class booster to fly 15 times. Coming up over the next seven days, we have Rocket Lab's first flight from the USA and Pleiades Neo 5 and 6 on a Vega C. Yeah, there's just two. I guess the space industry is being nice and giving everyone Christmas off. Before we go, thank you to the citizens of tomorrow who financially support once a month. If you want to send some pennies our way to help cover the cost of Station 204 and get yourself some epic perks whilst you're at it, such as access to our always wonderful member-only post show, head to join.tmro.tv or the join button below. And of course, if you just want to support us by watching our content and sharing it with your friends, that's a-okay too.
The schedule's still going to be a bit wonky next week, I'm afraid, as you may be getting a shorter Space News update on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday from me. I'm yet to decide a day, but you may or may not be getting one. Wednesday, though, you will be getting a space weather update from Tamitha. There wasn't one last Wednesday because by the time Tamitha had finished recording it, the sun had completely changed its pace. It was f flying off flares and stuff, and the segment was essentially out of date, so it would have been redundant to publish it. And on Friday, join Jared from Station 204 and me from New York City for our live show. That's it for today. Thank you for watching and goodbye.